Hey everybody, this is Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. The video you're about to watch is a production from our ministry. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We broadcast every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time here on YouTube. Uh, we have different pastors, teachers from different churches and denominations coming on the show to d discuss a wide range of theological topics. Many of our guests we agree with and many of our guests we disagree with, but our goal is to understand God's Word so that we can then understand the God who has given us His Word. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy this conversation. We hope it's been a benefit to you. Uh, if you do enjoy this video and want to continue to help us produce content like this, we'd ask that you go down into the description of the video and donate. There's a, a description link there in the video, and it would help us continue producing content just like this. Be blessed. Hey guys, we've got a really exciting episode with Kyle Worley today. We're going to be talking about Union with Christ. Yes. Uh, super excited about this show. Before we dive into it, Michael, how's your week, man? Week's going good. It's only Monday. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's pretty good. I've been homeschooling my children, and it's pretty tough. I don't know how many of you guys are doing that, but, I mean, I feel like I'm sitting on, like, the bench of small petty claims court or something and deciding disputes constantly. Sure. So, uh, happy to be here, though. Excited about this conversation. Yeah, no, I'm really excited. We've had a, a fun week. Uh, for those of you who can't see behind the camera, which is everyone, um, we have been knocking out studio walls, so the space is going to... So many walls knocked Double out over triple. here. Um, we knocked out a closet here. We knocked out a wall. I mean, we have so much more space. Um, I mean, we're, so, we're even knocking down walls. We don't even have to. Yeah. <laughs> Spiritually and physically, <laughs> knocking down walls everywhere. Uh, and then uh, if, if you haven't been following on Facebook, got a whole bunch of uh, uh, fun conversation that you can connect with us on Facebook. Just go over to Facebook and type in The Runet Radio. We released a meme this week. Uh, finish that meme. I'm preaching. And I happened to make the that one simply does not just uh, hand sign from the popular meme and had a whole bunch of people jump in. We had Mike Winger say, uh, preach to an empty room. One does not simply uh, uh, read from <laughs> the passion good. We translation. Had some good ones. We had a lot of really great stuff. So go check out the Facebook content, uh, you know, join, join up there and uh, continue. Oh, hey, I also us. wanted to make a comment. I think you guys are actually starting to see my facial hair. Oh, yeah. One of you even made some comments on it uh, recently, but you know, the, like the little, <laughs> Uh, what you have? What do you what do you call it? The logo for Remnant Radio? Uh, yeah, it's You're two to two him. bearded dudes. Yeah, there you go. I'm I'm trying to match You're your logo. To grow into the logo, y'all. Let us know in the comment section what you think. Well, that's enough. It's banter. no sh it's no shave Corona. Let's get to let's get to Kyle. Kyle, tell us a little about yourself and your ministry. I'm super excited for this conversation. Uh, this is gonna be a really rich dialogue. Yeah, I love the banter that you guys are doing as well. We, uh, I help run a podcast <laughs> called Faith, and we're constantly being trolled for too much banter. And so, hey, I'm I'm for it. So I love hearing about y'all today. Um, I'm the pro pastor, banter. Uh, yeah, pro banter. Uh, I, I I help plant Mosaic Church. I serve as one of the pastors at Mosaic Church in Richardson, Texas. We planted out the Village Church um, a little over two years ago now. Uh, I also run a podcast with my friends Jen and JT called Knowing Faith. We have a lot of fun with that. We're finishing up on season four, and that's been a blast. Uh, and then uh, I also, along with JT and Jen, run a cohort called Training the Church. And you can find out more information about that at trainingthechurch.com. And we have a lot of fun with Training the Church. Okay, so Union with Christ, it seems like a pretty broad topic. Uh, it seems to be just like one of those, those kind of like preaching points. When we talk about Union with Christ, it's like, unity or love like is union with christ a specific theological conversation or is it just a broad preaching point yeah that's well that's a great place to start it is a specific conversation that's happening and has been happening uh, in christian theology for quite some time and i would say it's absolutely crucial um and uh, uh, so as to say it is the bedrock or should be the foundation doctrine of our whole view of salvation that uh, if Luther said justification is the doctrine by which the church stands or falls, I would say nay to you, Luther. It is the doctrine of union with Christ. Can you say that on this show? Are you allowed to say nay to Luther, <laughs> like as a Protestant? I mean, but uh, hey, you 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 uh, you have to say nay to Luther on multiple occasions when reading him. Uh, Pedo baptism. He's, he's often off his rocker. So. <laughs> okay, Sean Smart. Hey, let's yeah. talk to us a little bit about the union with Christ. Um, uh, how do we conceptualize this idea that we are identified with Christ, that we have a participation with Christ? Yeah. What What is the the, the the subject matter that we're talking about today? Kind of break it apart for us. Yeah, so if we're talking about the doctrine of union with Christ, we're talking about the— 
I would say it's the mega theme or the found the content. It's very good. It is. Well, that's that's a super super awesome shout out. We Dawson, who's been on the show before, you guys know Dawson. Yeah, know uh, Dawson. he does a whole lot of work doing research content for all of our episodes. Something I I always forget to say the the top of the show. I always say it at the end. But if you go down into the uh, description of the show, there's a link to our website, and you can check out that whole. It's like 22 pages of Union with Christ uh, yeah. and dialogue about that. So so continue. Pick up where you where you left off. It's it's fantastic. I love um, Berkhoff's definition. It's a great place to start. I, I would say that, and this is one resource that wasn't mentioned in that study guide, but that I have to say at the beginning, I'm absolutely dependent on and would highly recommend. And I have it in front of me right here. Look at that. This is Paul and Union with Christ, an exegetical and theological study by Constantine Campbell. This book is an absolute must have for not just Doctrine of Union with Christ, but Pauline studies. So Constantine Campbell, fantastic. But I define Doctrine Back to over here. Okay, guys, sorry. I think we got a quick disconnect uh, with our settings. We try to test it before the show. Uh, so I apologize. I'll, I'll trim these together uh, so that you can give that definition without any kind of uh, 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 interruption after the live stream. So Kyle, go ahead and go right back into that. What was your definition I, of union with Christ? You broke sure. it down on identification or the whole thing? Yeah, I'll have, the him, definition? have him do it just in okay. case uh, uh, we Great. didn't catch it on the live stream. Yeah, I'm used to being interrupted. I'm on a podcast with two people that just love to chat. So I, I get interrupted all the time. <laughs> so that's no problem for me. Um, union with Christ is the believer's identification, participation, and incorporation uh, with, in, and through uh, the life, death, and resurrection, uh, ascension, and heavenly session of Christ Jesus. And I think all of that matters. I know it's wordy. Uh, I know it's wordy, uh, but I do think it really matters, particularly the words identification, participation, and incorporation. Okay, so can you unpack each of those for us? Yeah, for sure. So when we talk about identification in Christ Jesus, we're talking about that as we enter into Christ, and when we think about the doctrine of union with Christ, it really lives in the prepositions that we find in the New Testament. It's maybe most pronounced in the Gospel of John and then in the Pauline epistles, uh, but you could find it scattered throughout the New Testament, but certainly the Gospel of John and the Pauline epistles. You're going to see prepositions if, when, through, and into. I mean, Ephesians 1 is probably one of the greatest examples of this. Um, I think that uh, Ephesians 1 and 2 are just clagged full of these meaningful prepositions when thinking through the doctrine of union with Christ. But when I talk about identification, what I mean is that fundamentally for the Christian, uh, when we enter what salvation is, is entering into Christ Jesus by grace through faith. Uh, faith, as the old theologian called it, is the instrument of our salvation, drawing everything from the work of Christ and contributing nothing to it. But it is the way that we enter into Christ. And so when I say identification, I mean that for the Christian, they are fundamentally a Christian, not because uh, they simply have associated with Jesus uh, or that they are following Jesus, but because they are in Christ Jesus. To be a Christian is to be somebody who is in mystically, uh, meaning that it's not like it's in, like we're in this home right now, but but is in Christ Jesus. So that's identification. So I, I didn't how, break that down for us. Is there kind of, I mean, do we see this in the Old Testament? Is this kind of a new theological principle that just kind of jumps in on the New Testament? How are we identified with Christ? Uh, and, and does that flesh out? Is this a new thought of Paul or is this an Old Testament thing that is consistent through Scripture? For sure. No, it's definitely uh, picking up on a theme that is all throughout Scripture, which is this idea of headship. Uh, in particular, what the theologians have called federal or covenant headship is sometimes what it's referred to, uh, that Adam in the garden was our federal head. He was our representative before God, that in Adam we existed. And this is what Paul is talking about later on, particularly in Romans, when he's talking about that in this one man, many have become unrighteous. Uh, how is it that we have become unrighteous? Well, we have become unrighteous, not because we have done unrighteous things, but because we are in the unrighteous one, this one who was Adam. So Adam was our federal head or representative. And you see all sorts of representation of God's people among select persons throughout the Old Testament, kings, prophets, priests. These are all different forms of representatives, albeit none of them but Adam have the same sort of designation in the New Testament. He certainly carries a particularly pronounced weight in that he was a distinct kind of federal head in that his sin is what has tainted all of humanity after himself. But you do get to see a semblance of this with the covenant that God makes with Abraham as well. Right. Uh, 
that Abraham becomes a, a covenant head of those who will come after him. You, you see this in Genesis 12 and 15 and 22. But the notion of representation, of God's people being represented by a singular figure, is throughout the Old Testament. Again, albeit it's not as nearly pronounced with anybody as it is with Adam in the Old Testament. Okay. And uh, does it make any difference if, uh, let's say, so you've got the federal view, but then you also, the, the federal view represent representative view, but you also have uh, the seminal view where, you know, some people believe that, uh, for instance, in Romans 5.12, whenever it says that in Adam we sinned, yeah. right? Like, whereas one group says, well, we sinned because Adam represented us and we became sinners as a as an effect of that. But then the other view, the seminal view, would look at maybe like the, for instance, the scripture in Hebrews where it says that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek uh, through Abraham, even though he wasn't technically born yet. And so uh, all this to say, rather than Adam being our representative head, this this group says that we were literally in Adam sinning. So it wasn't just representatively, but literally in him sinning. And so... The reason I bring that up is, does this make any difference in our view on union or union with Christ, or is it just kind of like a neither here nor there as it relates to this doctrine? You know, that's a good question, Michael, and I'm not quite sure I've thought through that um, in terms of whether you take a federal or seminal representational view of Adam, whether that, if carried forward into your view of union mm -hmm. with Christ, would change the impact of that. I, I really don't know. I don't know that I've thought about that. That's a good question. Okay. Oh, that's cool. I was just curious. So, okay. So we've talked about identification. Now let's move to the next one. Was it participation? participation. Second yeah. one. Okay. Let's yeah, talk through that one. Because a lot of times when we think about identity, we can think in really passive or static terms, meaning that this is something that is, or it's merely like a, a state of affairs has changed. Like a, for example, like if we think about uh, identification as static, we might think about it like a new policy has been drawn up on our life. It feels like maybe a new constitution. But the idea of participation is not just that we are now in Christ Jesus, meaning that we're statically in him or positionally in him, but that we are participating of, with all of our life in Christ Jesus, meaning that all of our life – uh, happens in Christ as a Christian. Um, I think this is also what Paul is getting at with the diversity of prepositional phrases that he uses to talk about what it means to be in Christ, is that we're not just in Christ, but we're with Christ. Our life is lived through Christ Jesus. And so the idea of participation is merely to communicate that the doctrine of union with Christ is not simply that I have now been given a new home with God in Jesus, but that like any good and vibrant home, I am living in a well-furnished home that is stocked with rich foods uh, and where the realm of ideas and kind of the whole scope of the world is, uh, is able to be lived in and addressed with meaning and with purpose. And so participation is carrying forth with it the connotations that the New Testament has that our whole life is lived in Jesus Christ. It's not merely static but that we are living our life. This is what I think Burkhoff is saying when he uses the phrase, it's that intimate, vital, uh, meaning it's dynamic. It's something that is both life-giving and the source of abundant living. Okay. So when you say life-giving and the source of abundant living, so that, that certainly sounds like an empowerment, a grace, a, a work of sanctification of Christ in you. Um, but but how are, are we also identified? So we identify Christ in us, but we're also identified uh, uh, of us in him. Oh, sorry, say I think I got the, the other way around. Him and us, and us and him. Yeah, either way, cover up both my bases that way. Uh, so when Paul's on the road to Damascus, um, Christ comes down. Mm -hmm. Paul or Saul at the time, uh, um, because no one was calling him by a Greek name because he was speaking mm -hmm. with Jews. Uh, you know, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, we were identified in Christ. So when he was persecuting Christians, it was identified directly as he was persecuting Christ. Yep. How does that hash out? Well, how does that particular passage hash out? Yeah, with with, with union with Christ. Yeah. I mean, just to, to speak of uh, uh, this is participation, is it not? Or is this uh, incorporation? Talking about how we are participating with Christ, not in necessarily just a mission, but a co-mission. We're working together. So when when the world is attacking the church, 
the yeah. world is attacking Christ. Yeah. Uh, uh, is, is that a part of participation or is that a part of incorporation out of curiosity? No, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I think that it's probably that that passage in particular is probably pointing our gaze mostly at incorporation because it's the association yeah. of Christ with his whole people. And I think that instance is, uh, is a really important passage. And I've mentioned this on a couple other podcasts, but I think it's uh, the bedrock of why Paul ends up making the doctrine of union with Christ such a pronounced aspect of his theological project is because from the very moment of uh, Saul's conversion, um, he is encountering the risen Christ Jesus who is identifying with his people. Uh, And so that does get me to the third thing, though, which is incorporation, which is that it's not just that I have been brought into Christ Jesus, but I have been brought into Christ Jesus as one among many, which are all of God's people, past, present, and future, the global and historic church. To be someone who is a Christian, past, present, and future, is to be one who is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and that is the, that, that designation of incorporation, that it's not just me and me alone cutting against the grain of radical individualism that we kind of just say, well, it's just me and Jesus or me in Jesus uh, with the doctrine of union with Christ. But it is me and we in Jesus Christ. And you do get this. And this this gets into a little bit of kind of contemporary Pauline studies that would push us to maybe uh, – maybe resist an over-individualized view of salvation, that Paul had a much broader designation of the elect people than just us as individuals, though certainly not less than us as individuals. So it's our identification that now what can be said of Christ can be said of me because I am in him. Uh, It's our participation. All of my life happens in Christ Jesus, uh, or you might say all of our life has lived quorum Deo before the very face of God in the presence of God because we are in Christ who is at the right hand of God. Mm. And then our incorporation, which means it's not just me by myself living my life with Jesus, but it's me in communion with all the saints, past, present, and future uh, in Christ Jesus together. That must have been something I misunderstood in in the participation piece because I was even thinking probably— Coramundo of of living my life before people as I as Christ empowers me it's a participation of Christ in me working out but you're saying Coram Deo as in as the way that I live righteous before God uh, yeah. that Christ I'm in Christ that, that that's beautiful it's great so when when talking about these these positions are, is the identity piece the participation piece um, the incorporation piece are these theological um, um, ideologies that we're just kind of supposed to put in precepts and categories are these things to be experienced? Do people experience this identity change? Do people experience uh, the the mecca of Ephesians chapter the, the mecca of uh, what do you, what would you call it? Uh, 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 prepositions, you know, of in Christ with Christ uh, in Him. You know, you're blessed with every blessing in the spiritual places in Christ Jesus. In Him, you've been given the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In Him, over and over and over, uh, there in Ephesians one, two, and three. Uh, uh, when we look at those passages, are these things to be experienced or are these just kind of theological truths of what Christ has already done? Well, they are truths of what Christ has done, but they are truths that should be experienced by the believer. Uh, I, I certainly believe that. And, and on my um, on the days in which I am nearest to the Lord, I think I get to walk in the enjoyment of them most richly. But I do think this is an opportunity to talk about a distinction that we often make between union uh, and communion. And uh, if union is the securing of all of the benefits of salvation in Christ Jesus, communion is the enjoying of all the benefits that have been secured in Christ Jesus. Uh, And these things absolutely have to live together. So I would not say that my enjoyment of these realities is the thing that validates them as true. I think they're true Mm -hmm. because that God in Christ has secured them to be true and the spirit of God has applied them to the lives of all of God's people. But my communion with God is the way in which I mine the depths and let the taste of union with Christ linger in my mouth for enjoyment and for experience. And so, yes, I would say that the doctrine of union with Christ is not merely something that can be enjoyed, but something that must be enjoyed by the believer. And I think that that's part of what Paul's getting at. Okay. Um, So Kyle, uh, could you walk us through these three steps, identification, participation, and incorporation? You've walked us through them in terms of just sort of their understanding in relation to scripture. But now that you've brought in the communion piece of it, maybe even inviting us in a little bit into your own spiritual life, what does it look like for you to exercise communion with the Lord as it relates to identification, 
communion with the Lord as it relates to participation yeah. and as it relates to incorporation. Help us understand what this looks like so that we understand just the practical outworkings in our lives. That's a great question. And um, uh, to do that, I would want to go to Paul in Romans 6, 7, and 8 if I could, because I actually think Romans 6, 7, and 8 is a very clear depiction of Paul trying to work this out real time. I mean, how does Paul open up Romans 6? What shall we say to these things? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And then he goes into talking about what it means to be united to Jesus's death and resurrection. So for Paul, the, 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 the primary way that one comes to understand the needlessness of sin, the unsatisfactory nature of continuing in sin, is not that, hey, if you continue in sin, you'll lose grace and justification. That's not Paul's argument. His argument is you shouldn't continue in sin. Why? Well, because you have been united with Christ in his death and resurrection. He goes on to say, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And in verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Where? In Christ Jesus. And so mm. the primary, so if you're talking about one practical import of our identification in Christ Jesus or the doctrine of union with Christ— is that Paul is saying the primary motivation for you to no longer persist in sin is because when you persist in sin, you don't invalidate the salvation that God has secured. But what you do is you drink from a dead well, and I'm inviting you to drink from a new well that's in Christ Jesus. And this well is full of living water and not that swill that you used to drink. You see, it, Paul's primary motivation for Christian obedience is the doctrine of union with Christ. That's why John Owen said, and the mortification of sin. The Christian is one who is more motivated to stay away from sin than the non-Christian, not because they're afraid of the judgment of God, but because they have enjoyed the very beauty of the God who has saved them. That's the motivation for Christian salvation. Right. Greater delight. That's good. So it's not in order to become alive, but because we're alive, exactly. that we want to follow through. Okay, so there, there's an example of identification. Now walk us through uh, to participation. How does this look in your communion with the Lord? Yeah, so when we think about participation in Christ Jesus, we're thinking about getting to live a life that is uh, dynamically infused with the Spirit of God. Uh, and I think this means that we get to enjoy the delighting love of God in all that we do, and we get to um, uh, we get to go into the world alive to the true story. So we get to go into the world knowing that we are in Christ the King, and that nothing in the world can separate us from this. Paul in Romans eight, we get to live brave and free, taking risk and being courageous. Why? Because nothing in all of creation, neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor rulers, nor famine, nor sword, nor nakedness, nor danger, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. And where does Paul say this love of God is? In Christ Jesus. And so what it means that we get to participate in Christ Jesus is that Christians get to enjoy not just the gracious love of God that forgives us of all our sins, which is certainly a crucial dimension to understanding the love of God, but the delighting love of God, which means that we get to live as sons and daughters, that we're not, God doesn't just look upon us with the love that forgives. He looks upon us with the love that delights, and he can look upon us with the love that delights, and we can live freely knowing that we're delighted in. Why? Because we're in Christ Jesus, the beloved son of God. So I think for participation, how many of us spend our whole lives trying to fight for a beloved designation? I love this quote from uh, Birdman. Have you ever seen the movie? It's kind of a Tencent movie, but the quote's really good. It's from a poem. What have I lived my whole life for? But to be beloved. That's what we want. We want to be beloved. And in Christ Jesus, we get to live life not grasping for a beloved designation, but having already received it. That's a pretty incredible foundation for risky and radical living. Okay. Well, should we go for the last yeah. one, incorporation? Let's do it. What does it, it look like? What does it yeah. look like? It means that I enter into Christ Jesus by grace through faith, and that I am joined by the past, present, and future global and universal church. And so when my brothers and sisters in Christ in North Africa recite the Apostles' Creed before the sun rises in the great city of Richardson, Texas, their voices echo not in the halls of our church, but in the heart of Christ Jesus. And that I get to know that as a participant 
I may not ever get a sense that any local church I'm a part of is fully representative of the kingdom, but I know that in Christ Jesus, I am a participant, a co-participant, a brother and sis- a brother in Christ to brothers and sisters around the world and throughout all of human history that are proclaiming and praising the very same Savior that I am. That this incorporation means that I am surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses uh, as I look to run the race that is set before me, uh, and that I have an incredibly rich heritage and legacy of faith. Uh, And all of that is rooted in Jesus Christ and that I have not just been brought into Jesus by myself, but I have been given a new family. And with this new family comes new family traditions, the ordinances, the gathering of God's people. And that maybe the brokenness of my home is something that has shaped me. But in Christ Jesus, I'm given a new home with a new family and traditions that are glorious and formative and beautiful and rooted in the history and the global nature of the church. And I think that's an incredibly profound reality. That's awesome. No, it's it's great. Hey, I've got a, a question. Um, uh, uh, you keep saying that by grace through faith. I know that there are a few views about union with Christ that that seem to indicate a sustained uh, union with Christ by a sustained faith. Mm-hmm. That if a person at some point wavers or doubts, is their union with Christ in any form of jeopardy? Um, as it is the faith that gives us access to this union. But before I have you answer that question, we're gonna do a quick word from our sponsor. Hey guys, the song you're listening to right now is from Stonebridge Worship. Now, Stonebridge is sponsoring this episode of Remnant Radio, and last week they sent us a Dropbox link to this full album. And I'm telling you, this album is awesome. It's edifying. The quality is spot on. And if you haven't checked out Stonebridge Worship, just go over to your Spotify channel and type in Worthy Is Jesus. That's the song you're listening to right now. Uh, The song is amazing. Uh, And if if you don't have Spotify, man, go check out their YouTube video link. I put it in the description of this video at the bottom. You can watch the full music video that you're watching right now. And another, man, big thank you to Stonebridge Worship and sponsoring this episode of Remnant Radio. Cool. Pick up right where we left off uh, that question there. Uh, faith is is the amount of faith that we participate, that we give continually. Is that is that going to affect our union with Christ if we have more faith or less less faith? Faith on a given day is that going to affect how we're united with Christ? That's a great question. And the answer is a resounding no, Uh, that our union with Christ is not contingent on our faith, but on the faithfulness of Jesus. God in Christ has secured for his people. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 1, even as he chose us in him. So right there, you get the designation that we are in Christ Jesus. That's one of those incredible metaphors, those prepositions that we see that who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So we don't get there a separation between our holiness and blamelessness. We get an intimate connection between our holy and blameless condition and our election in Christ Jesus. And so to say the doctrine of union with Christ, I would say, say it as, as maybe as extremely as I could. The doctrine of union with Christ, uh, this idea that by grace through faith we enter into Christ Jesus, is saying this. It is saying that God, as we as he secures our salvation in Jesus Christ, both in the actual works of Christ and in the works that flow from the work of God in Christ, meaning our effectual call, when God calls us to himself, regeneration, where he replaces our heart of stone with a heart of flesh and we're born again, and when we're given new life. These things happen as the direct result of God, and there is nothing that we can do, uh, past, present, or future, to break or disrupt that great work of God in our life. But our communion with God can be disrupted, which is our enjoyment of those saving benefits. And I find as a pastor that most often when people are struggling with assurance of salvation, what they're experiencing is a disruption of the enjoyment of the saving benefits that God has secured in Jesus. And they're associating with that with the loss of those saving benefits. And that is a very easy jump to make. And yet it is a jump that is thwarted not by the faith of man or the doubt doubtlessness of man's faith, but because of the great security of God's grace. Okay. Okay. So you came back to the theme of communion versus union for a moment answering that question. So that makes me, 
little bit curious about your view of John chapter 15 and the, yeah. uh, and the metaphor of the vine and the branches. And so do you understand this to be a metaphor communicating our union with Christ as in what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 1 and 164 other times throughout the New Testament when he uses that phrase, in Christ? Or do you understand it to be more a reference to our union with Christ? And the yeah. reason I think this has relevance is because you have some branches getting cut off and thrown into the fire. Yeah. So, uh, so how do you understand that? I passage? think this is, a, this is a fantastic question. And I feel that John 15 is one of those passages that's most often associated with union. But what I, but, uh, but, but I think is much more um, connected to this notion of being actively abiding in Christ Jesus. Um, and that uh, Jesus's intention with John 15 is not to um, – uh, not to circumnavigate or to dodge the reality that his uh, that his people will be kept by himself, but is an admonition and an exhortation, much like we hear from Jesus throughout the Gospels. You think of another passage that's kind of close to the same sentiment here is in Matthew. Many will cry to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do X and Y and Z in your name? And yet you and yet they are turned away. I think that both of these passages are functioning as deterrents for those who would presume upon the grace of God with a deceitful heart, not for those who genuinely are looking to remain in Christ Jesus but faltering. I think that this is recaptured in uh, John 17 when Jesus in his high priestly prayer talks about uh, 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 that, would that would they be one with you as I was one with you. So I think that what we're getting in John 17 is a much more emphatic perspective on the doctrine of union with Christ, whereas in John 15, the principal aim seems to be to motivate the benefits of communion with God in Christ Jesus or the activity of abiding. So if we're just going to push on that a little bit, what the pruning text, what would you, what would you, how, how would you kind of interpret that? If it, if it's the benefit of, Hey, you can't do anything without me. Is there also a warning that you see in the text of, but by the way, if you don't continue to abide in me, you're going to get chopped off. Yeah. No, I think that the, what, what we experience is that there are those who, having entered in— well, first off, there are those who have having um, feigned to enter into union with Christ or having adopted a pretense of Christianity will be judged. I think this is the parable of the wheat and the tares. I think sure. this, is the great, this is the great judgment of separation, of winnowing. And I think that this is part of what John 15 has in mind. But I do think that there is another aspect here that is significant which is that there are those who, having entered into union with Christ by grace through faith, they refrain, sometimes for, a long, uh, for long periods of time, from the rich enjoyment of those benefits. They grow distant and far from him whom they have made their dwelling in. Uh, and when that happens, I do think that there is a discipline that the Lord incurs. I think this is what Hebrews is talking about, that the Lord disciplines the one he loves that there is a discipline that happens to God's people during those times, which could be associated with pruning here in this passage. So I do think that some of the metaphors we get in the New Testament around pruning seem to focus more on the disciplinary nature of the father who loves his children and is bringing them back to the benefit, enjoying the benefits he has secured for them in Christ. And there are uh, pictures where this pruning seems to be more associated with the winnowing judgment of God of separating those who have genuinely entered into Christ Jesus and those who have merely adopted a pretense, either for exploitation or deception. Okay, so you would say the branches that are being thrown away in the fire are the false believers, whereas maybe those who aren't bearing fruit for a while or are having some trouble, there may be some pruning that goes along, but there's no removing of the branch. Is yep. that what you're saying? Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, Kyle, help us understand... Um, I guess here's my question. What is it? You're, you're obviously very passionate about this subject. What is it that you feel like you just want people to get? Like people don't understand this about union with Christ. You know, you're, you're calling it the bedrock, the foundation, the umbrella. I mean, this is huge for you. It's not huge for a lot of people. Yeah. Where is the disconnect? Why are you why are you so passionate about this? What is it that people aren't understanding that you wish they would? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, and I, I'd be clear. I don't know that it's just huge for me. I think it's the mega theme of Paul's writings on the doctrine. Yeah, I, I didn't mean he's it like, that way. He's but like, hey, why is this passion? You, he's like, look, this is 
God is passionate about this. You tend, you tend to really care about what God cares about. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that the doctrine of view with Christ is incredibly significant because we often give people a view of the doctrine of salvation that gives them that t- gives them a perspective on God's work in their life right up to the point of their conversion and no further. But the doctrine of union with Christ not only entails all of this great work of forgiveness that God has done, but then gives you the appropriate lens by which to see the rest of your Christian life through. And I think that is absolutely missing from discipleship in the life of the church. That's why the doctrine of union with Christ is not just theologically necessary for us to make sense of the whole story of Scripture. It's not just theologically necessary to make sense of what Paul is talking about when he talks about salvation. And it's not even to help us make sense of the relationship between the acts of Christ in history and the reception of those benefits, though it's true and necessary for all of those reasons. It's also true and necessary because it's the primary way that the believer should conceive of their present and future status before the Lord. And that's incredibly huge. Why is a believer motivated to continue in the faith that they have been given? Why are they motivated to continue to cultivate the rich benefits that God has entrusted to them in Jesus? Well, it's because you can actually grow in your enjoyment of God in Christ Jesus. It's not merely that you've been forgiven and that the debt has been cleared, but that now you're actually free to enjoy abundant life and spirit-filled living, and you get to actually grow near to God. That the doctrine of union with Christ says you can radically pursue the riskiness of pursuing holiness, pursuing intimacy with the Lord, walking in the Spirit, abounding in the fruit of the Spirit, knowing that your salvation isn't up for grabs, but that you can grow in your rich enjoyment of God, that you can have more delight in Him uh, three years from now and more obedience in His ways three years from now than you do now. And that at no point in that journey, at any step back, or any faltering or any falling in, falling into a pit, at no point is your salvation up for grabs. That's incredible. I mean, that's just a fantastically profound reality. You think about motivation for the Christian life. Yeah, so we have this kind of consumerism that this really fights against, where you know you come into church, uh, you're trying to get some fire insurance, the pastor has you pray this prayer, you, you accept Jesus into your life, right? Uh, so I, I've got Jesus in my life now, I'm good uh, with because I've been justified now. We're putting a primary emphasis on justification, uh, but the work of God actively being evolved in your life from that moment on, where, where you have some of those Christians who just walk away after being justified because of a prayer that they made, uh, and they don't pursue any kind of long-term relationship with Christ. And you've got other Christians who pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Jesus saved me, but now I better do the rest to keep myself saved. I better do the rest so that I can earn approval before God because I've been for- forgiven of my sins, but I'm not I'm not as spiritually elite as the rest. This pre- creates a, a level playing field of believers. And, and what it does is it allows us to put faith in God for our justification and our continued faith in Christ as in we enjoy him at greater and greater lengths. It seems to solve a, quite a few problems in the kind of consumer evangelical world that we're in right now. Yeah, I think it absolutely does. And I think that it also motivates Christian obedience in a very distinct way. The the motivation isn't, well, what if I don't? The motivation is, what will I lose today if I choose disobedience as opposed to obedience? What rich aspect of Christ Jesus Mm. will I not get to savor today if I choose sin over righteousness? That is a lot— Well, yeah, and I think that that's the primary motivation for Christian belief, and it's limbering us up for what all of eternity will be, all of forever future will be rich enjoyment of Christ Jesus. Awesome. Hey, so uh, I'm curious how, like, just what did this look like for Old Testament believers? Is this 100%, this is our experience as New Testament New Covenant believers, and they didn't get any of this, or or what did that, or was it like, well, you know, you go to Romans chapter three in regard to justification and the benefits of the cross as it pertains to justification specifically, go backwards in time because God, in His forbearance, passed over the sins previously committed, but then at the right time, Christ Jesus was crucified, and uh, and so His justifying benefits went backward as well as forward for anyone who had faith. So, uh, so Abraham's sins, for instance, Abraham was still justified because of the sacrifice of Christ, even though that came after him. So, 
did the in Christ reality exist for him, or is that uh, just our privilege? That's a great question, and it, it must have existed for him, even if he could only perceive it thinly through the eyes of faith. And the reason for it is that there is no justification outside of Christ Jesus. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The only way for us to be declared righteous is to be in Christ Jesus. And so for Abraham to receive a righteous designation is to receive the righteous designation of Christ. There is no righteousness outside of Jesus Christ. I mean, Calvin is trying to get at this point when he says, oh, gosh. Uh, let me pull this up. I don't want to misquote Calvin here. That would be bad. Um, I do not see how anyone can trust that he has redemption and righteousness in the cross of Christ and life in his death unless he relies chiefly upon a true participation in Christ himself. For those benefits would not come to us unless Christ first made himself ours. Uh, that is a uh, that is a very clearly stated uh, way, uh, way of, uh, of arguing what you just talked about, which is that Abraham could only receive the righteousness that Christ has secured in Jesus Christ. Righteousness is not a gift that God can give outside of giving it in Christ Jesus. So this is this is a great kind of question to kind of lead into maybe some of the other uh, views of union with Christ, right? We have the the Roman Catholic Church that sees union with Christ um, through certain kind of works. We're unified with Christ through the sacraments. Uh, we can see maybe uh, in some more mystical camps that we we're unified with Christ in worship and in prayer uh, and these kind of spiritual experiences. Uh, and we already talked about uh, maybe more of a Lutheran view that we're united to Christ in faith. Uh, but 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 you would you view the union with Christ as a covenantal thing that Christ establishes, and because Christ establishes it through kind of a, a covenant or a federal uh, in a federal kind of position. Please correct my articulation of this if I'm doing a poor job. Uh, but that that we have faith and assurance no matter what we do, whether it's our prayer and worship is off, our faith is off, our whatever is off. We can have assurance because it was it was a federal work of His covenant, His covenant alone. So we can trust that even with our unfaithfulness. What, what kind of damage does these other views of communion, uh, of, of prayer and worship, and, and our, dependent on our faith to have union with Christ, how do these things uh, uh, negatively affect the gospel message? Oh, that's a good question. I'd probably be hesitant to like bundle all of the divergent views of union in and say— any of the ones that I'm not articulating are going to hurt the gospel, but okay. I will say that. So I want to be careful. Who, who do you want to bash? Yeah, I don't know. We, just, Josh wants names. No, no. I I, more, more so that like if, if this is worth fighting for, if this is something that's really uh -huh. passionate, um, it must be because it glorifies Christ supremely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we we wouldn't want to to not glorify Him. How how, how is this? Is, how essential is this? Is really what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's absolutely essential, um, and yet there are um, – I, I, again, this is a, a great time to refer. I was really impressed with this little resource document that uh, Dawson put together. It's fantastic. He does a great job here of outlining a good, a good kind of hatchet version of a lot of views here, and so hats off there to Dawson Gerald. Um, but I would say that um, when we're thinking about – let's just take sacramental union, for example. And let's talk about the way that the body and blood of Christ or the sacraments become ways of receiving the merits or the merit, the, uh, the, uh, the meriting benefits of Christ Jesus. My, uh, my push on that would be that much of what we want to receive as benefit through the sacraments or much of what the Catholic Church wants us to receive as benefits through the sacraments is really uh, there. It's like drawing thimbles. And God is inviting us into this incredible well. And it's like, for me, with a view of sacramental union, it's like, I don't want the benefits of Christ in Dixie cups. I want the mm -hmm. benefits of Christ in an inexhaustible well. And I want the communion elements. And by this, I mean the actual Lord's table. I want it to be a reminder that every time that I take in the body and blood, I can say to myself, as near to me as these elements are, Christ is nearer still. My mm. union with Christ and my reception of his benefits is more real than any of the sacraments as much as they are participating in our real-time reality could ever be. So I'm all for the idea that this is a true reality and a reality that we can cultivate rich enjoyment of, although I do find that, there are, that many of the 
again, more sacramental views of union typically trade what feels more tangible with what feels more real. And it's an exchange I'm unwilling to make on the witness of scripture and on the experience of knowing that I get to know that while I may not tangibly be able to uh, to tie the benefits of union with Christ in a way that sacramental views on union can, I can say that the benefits that I am enjoying are more real and more certain because they're locked into the certainty of Christ and not on the certainty of my faithfulness to receive them. Awesome. Okay. Now, when it comes to the sacraments and specifically baptism and communion, uh, do you believe that there's something different and special that it does for your union with Christ? Uh, and just to reference a couple of, uh, of verses, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, I believe it's uh, verse 18, where it speaks of how we have a, quote, participation. It's the Greek word for fellowship. Yeah. Participation in the blood of Jesus and in the body of Jesus mm -hmm. at the Lord's table. Yep. So I'm going to hit pause on that one for a moment and then come to Romans 6, sure. uh, where he talks about that it's through baptism that we enter into uh, the death of Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, some would argue that, hey, the, the moment of this identification in Christ is at baptism. That's why we have such a high sacramental theology is, mm -hmm. hey, it's baptism is where we're entering in right here. And, and so I bring those two elements of the Lord's Supper and baptism. And so I'm just trying to, uh, to speak from a, a perspective of some of our viewers who are listening to you talk about the, the sacramental perspective. So I just... Wanted to hear your commentary on those two verses. Yeah, that's great. And I'm going to be probably in lockstep with Calvin on this, as I am with much of what my thoughts are, and that I take a spiritual view of both baptism and the Lord's Supper, meaning that I think that baptism and the Lord's Supper can be called sacraments and that they convey sanctifying grace that reorients us to the reality uh, that has been secured for us in Christ Jesus. So I do not think that they communicate the same grace that is present in our union with Christ, which is when we become heirs by virtue of entering into Christ Jesus of all the benefits that he has secured and his whole legacy of faithfulness. But I think that they are sanctifying benefits of communion with God, meaning the reorientation or the turning of our vision towards that which is true and certain in Jesus. So, yes, I do think that something spiritual happens at baptism and that this thing that happens is that through the ordinance or sacrament of baptism, that we are further conformed and further prepared to enjoy all of the rich benefits that God has secured for us in Jesus. And I think that communion is a weekly rehearsal and remembrance that through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have become, uh, we have been uh, reconciled to God. We have been made heirs. Uh, it's the, like Hebrews 10. We have confidence to enter the holy places. Why? By the new and living way that he's opened up through the curtain that is through his flesh. And every week in communion, as we receive the elements of the Lord's Supper, we get to enter back in and remind ourselves that even if we have felt distant from the rich enjoyment of the presence of God, our security in his presence is secure because of what Christ has done through the broken body and shed blood. So yes, a spiritual view of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which communicates sanctifying grace, but not justifying grace. It's the grace of communion, not the grace of union. Okay, this is great. Uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be wrapping up here pretty soon. So if you're out there, you're, you've got questions that you've got. Uh, toss as many of those questions in here now because we've only got 10 minutes left in the program. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much for, for coming on the show up into this point as we're dialoguing about union with Christ. Uh, can you maybe help us? What are what are some kind of uh, some mysterious areas that we talk about union with Christ where you don't have a ton of certainty on? Or yeah. do you feel like this is, uh, because I think I've heard you in a couple of your podcasts say, man, there are some areas, whether it be uh, are we identified in Christ in creation, those kinds of areas that, that seem a little bit more mysterious that you're still working out? Yeah, that's a great question. And boy, that list is a lot longer than the list of the areas where I feel a lot of certainty. So certainly if we are in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world and the Son of God, Christ Jesus, was involved in the creation of the world, then we're actually, what were we doing in Christ? Was it this mm -hmm. future chosenness where like eventually we would be in him by virtue of salvation? So what does it actually mean to be in Christ Christ? 
or for the foundation of the world. Certainly, we often talk about that in terms of that means that our salvation is secure because it's God's work in Christ. But I do think it raises some really interesting questions about what we were doing before we were created if we had been chosen in Christ. That's one. I think another one is when Paul says that we have been seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Because Paul doesn't just stop with our identification with Christ and his death, resurrection, uh, but, but also ties it to the ascension and what we call the heavenly session of Christ Jesus, meaning what Jesus is presently doing at the right hand of God the Father, ruling and reigning, interceding at the right hand of the Father on behalf of all of his people, mediating this new covenant. So what does it mean that we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places? And in what sense do, can I become an enjoyer or a partaker of this already not yet reality? Like, like imagine this. You're sitting in some studio somewhere, and yet at present, Scripture says that you are also seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now, I mean, that's an inc- – I, I don't really know – means uh, other than to, to be able to say it is true that you are seated in this studio, but it is also simultaneously true that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. It can be easy to boil that down to merely representation, but yet I'm hesitant to do so. Uh, and so those are some of the things that I do feel a lot of mystery when it comes to the doctrine of union with Christ and how it plays out real time in the life of the believer. So I've got I've got two questions from our audience viewers. Uh, uh, Josh asks, uh, "What are the best books on this for rookies and for people who are mature?" I'll let you knock that one out, but I'll kind of ask a question right behind that. A question from Dawson. He asked the question: Is imputation necessary or redundant due to the doctrine of union with Christ? Uh, if we are have union with Christ, is the idea of imputation kind of redundant? Is this this is is this John Dawson? <laughs> Is this you, Josh, and Dawson, the other Dawson? There's another Josh in the comment section okay. and and the Dawson who wrote the, the study guide. So, yeah, uh, uh, someone who's well-versed on the subject matter for sure. For, uh, for sure. Okay, so let's let's answer the book one first because that, that's great. There are some great books on the doctrine of union with Christ. Mike Reeves has a great book, Rejoicing in Christ, which is fantastic. Uh, it, it's really good. That would be a good kind of introduction. Another great book uh, by a guy I really like is Paul Miller's book, J-Curve. Dying and Rising with Jesus in Everyday Life. This is probably the best book I've read on making the doctrine of union with Christ just so practical for the life of the believer. And so highly recommend this book. I had books with me. Do you like the props? Do you like this? Oh, yeah. yeah keep keep them it. coming. Keep them coming. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two more that I would point out. This is a little bit more, like I would say, a little bit further in. If you read those other two, if you want something that was a little bit more meaty, Paul, An Outline of a Theology by Herman Ritterboss. This is fantastic. This is also essential reading on all things Paul. And so, but he has incredible stuff in here on the doctrine of union with Christ, which I highly recommend. And then the book I mentioned by Constantine Campbell, this is also a fantastic book. Um, I would say it's a must read on the topic. So those are some good books on the doctrine of union with Christ, but with basic and a little bit more advanced on Dawson's question. I think Dawson is actually, he's actually uh, grasping at something that I, I think is pretty Uh, pretty important for the theological significance of this conversation right now. Um, If I can mention two things, and this may feel a little bit more technical, but do we, do we have time? Oh yeah, please do. Absolutely. So um, there's, there's a conversation that's been going on um, among New Testament scholars in particular uh, over the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, It's sometimes called the new perspective on Paul, but at the heart of that conversation is a couple of things. One, what does the word faith mean in the Bible? That's a big one. Another one is what is the notion of righteousness? Like what does it mean to be righteous? And what does it mean to say that God was going to make us righteous? Uh, and, And then tied into that is the concept of justification. What does it mean to be declared righteous? Now, we can't get into all the details of that. I'm, I'm sure that you guys have either covered this in a previous episode or that you would cover it in a future episode. But yes, to say the New Testament ha- uh, that the New Testament field has been dominated by this conversation, particularly Pauline studies for the last 30 or 40 years. It has been the hot topic to talk about. And I actually think that the doctrine of union with Christ helps us in very significant ways. Part of N.T. Wright and E.P. Sanders and a large community of New Testament scholars who have pushed against 
very Lutheran views of being declared righteous or imputed righteousness, like Dawson's question was, what it means that, that God, uh, that we were unrighteous and that a, a kind of a hatchet version of the, rep, the reformed version of justification is we were unrighteous. Christ was the righteous one at the cross. God exchanged our unrighteousness. Great exchange, yeah. The great exchange placed our unrighteousness on Jesus and placed Jesus' righteousness on us. That's a kind of very hatchet version of a broadly reformed understanding or Lutheran understanding of justification. And um, N.T. Wright and other scholars have pushed back on that, suggesting that it doesn't capture, uh, one, the Greek range of certain words, uh, the concept of righteousness in Second Temple Judaism and the world of the New Testament, and also that it put, that it is not a helpful indicator of how people uh, have how, how Second Temple Jews viewed their relationship to God. That it is not a relationally strong enough category to really capture what justification or righteousness meant. And I think that between these two camps, the doctrine of union with Christ comes as a handshake in the middle between those who would say, "Well, hold on." Is it the faithfulness of Jesus that is really at play in our declaration of righteousness? The doctrine of union with Christ can say, absolutely, it is the faithfulness of Jesus. Okay, well, then how do we receive that? Well, we receive that declaration of righteous faithfulness of Christ by faith in Christ. And so I do think doctrine of union with Christ, I don't, I wouldn't say that it makes imputation irrelevant, but I would say that it is the, the best relational frame with which to view this forensic work. Um, you might say that justification is the forensic foundation to our union with Christ. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a declaration of righteousness that happens from a father to a child, not from a judge to a, uh, a condemned man. That metaphor, does, it doesn't hold uh, when you think about the doctrine of justification in within the context of union with Christ. So I think that's one big conversation that it helps with, and I think it doesn't make imputation irrelevant, but it definitely gives it a new and I think very helpful relational context. Um, That's there, there is a second conversation that it helps with, which is going on Go right now, which is a, maybe a little bit more inside baseball, but I think it's significant. There are a couple of conversation partners in this. There's kind of uh, there's a guy named Greg Gilbert uh, who uh, recently gave a talk at Together for the Gospel on the nature of what is the gospel or the center of the gospel. Uh, and then there is another group of scholars, Matthew Bates, who wrote a great book called Salvation by Allegiance Alone, Scott McKnight, who's the author of a book called The King Jesus Gospel. Both of these groups have been pushing uh, on a conversation that where Matthew Bates and Scott McKnight would say, we should distinguish between the gospel proper, meaning the actual history and story of Jesus Christ, the actual deeds of Jesus and bringing the kingdom, and gospel benefits, which are the saving benefits that the work of Christ secures, which are more of the output of the gospel. Others would say you can't distinguish between those two things because the apostolic witness seems to so thoroughly associate them together. Justification, for example, on the cross of Jesus. That would be a, a, an area where you might say, well, the gospel proper is that Jesus died. The gospel benefit is that because of the death of Jesus, we can be declared righteous. And I would say that union with Christ actually functions as a middle way, saying that Christ is not just the center of the gospel story, but he's the source of gospel benefits. And so I do think that the doctrine of union with Christ doesn't make imputation irrelevant, but it brings it more fully into the overall story and doesn't isolate it as merely one gospel benefit to be detached from the gospel work. That may have been too much. I'm sorry, but I no, think that was great. Good. That's great. It makes it all connected. I think that's super healthy. Uh, Michael, you had any closing thoughts, man? Uh, well, there's, there's one question. I just think it's a good question we right. should ask. So it's, it's from crew. Uh, he says, does my personality or individuality matter if I'm fully in Christ? So, uh, so maybe uh, on this, a scripture I think of, Galatians chapter 2, the famous verse, I've been crucified with Christ so that I no longer live. So maybe putting some kind of flesh and bone on this question, am I losing my identity when I identify with Christ? How would you answer that? Man, that is such a great question. Um, so, so no, I, I would say that it's... Um, it would be the same of being like, well, if I, if I, had, a, if I had rich soil in my backyard... And I had five varieties of flower, and I plant uh, flowers. And I planted those flowers, 
in the rich soil in the backyard, would any of them be less distinct because they all emerged from the same soil? It's like, no, they all grew in this rich mm. soil. And that the only way that they were able to become what they were intended to be as seeds was to be in the right environment. It would be like saying a fish is less free because they escape the bondage of the ocean, right? <laughs> that they break out of the shackles of the sea and having escaped this thing of which they were associated with, with all these other fishes, that now they're more free and they can really be who they are. It's like, no, we, we were created to live with God. We will be most distinctively human whenever we are with God. And we can only be with God if we are in Jesus. And so as we enter into union with Christ, we should not see a diminishing um, of what makes us distinctively us, but we should see a flourishing of those things. Because now what is distinctive about us doesn't have to be propositioned and bargained for the love that we are created for, but can be lived freely without any sense of having to garner earn or to grasp at love, but because it's been given freely, we can live freely as we are in Jesus Christ, being made into the image of whom we were created to live in and with. So no, I, I think that rather than it diminishing our individuality, it distinguishes it in a pronounced way. It sounds like yeah, the distinction, like me and me and Dawson were talking about this earlier today, and it, I know it's a bit off subject, I think, but the idea of... Um, uh, the ontological change that happens within um, within humanity when they have saving faith in Christ. Yeah. There's something that changes within us. We have another nature now. Uh, we have Adam's nature, but we're, on, we're ontologically not being changed into the ontological nature of God. Right. We are ontologically man being transformed into ontologically glorified man, <laughs> you know, both man on both sides, right? Like the, the, the theosis view, uh, but, but within the most orthodox uh, uh, standards of it. Yep. If we were to be ontologically changed into uh, God himself, uh, then in fact, we would lose ourselves. But in fact, we are, we are in Adam being glorified into a glorified state of that human, that human nature. Does that, that seem right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, will, I, would, I would say that when we talk about our doctrine of union with Christ, we're not talking about that we essentially become God, but that we right. relationally become like the son with the father. Perfectly. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, man, really, really enjoyed this conversation. If you guys are here in uh, the comment chat, uh, we're going to probably piece these videos together as I'm watching the live view. Uh, it looks like our first clip and our second clip were separated. I'm going to connect those things.